Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing? I am doing well. Thanks. Yeah. So she's running a little late. Yeah. So I think she took her daughter to dance classes. So that's okay. You know, I'm of the mindset right now is let it flow. <laughs> Just oh, yeah. Let it flow. So, yeah. Uh, so there's Becky. Hello, Becky. How are you? Yeah, we, we've had uh, quite a few events this week, and some have gone well, some have not gone. So, yeah, it's like, you know, on to the next thing, people, you know, like that. Yeah, so, yeah, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. There you go. I think that's a song. <laughs> <laughs> From Kelly and nobody, Clarkson. Yeah, nobody dies here. Right? So, yeah, <laughs> that's, so that's fine. That's yeah, right. and yeah. And, and Becky, are you going like, what conversation have I just hopped into? Yeah, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. No. <laughs> well, it's stormy out my way. It wasn't supposed to rain until later on. Oh. So I hear some um, storms. And I have reliable internet. Spectrum is pretty good. So I was going to kind of head back to my office, which really looks like a tornado hit it. So it's <laughs> <laughs> That, well, the key is to just hide things out of camera range, which is what I've done. So it's, you know, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my my thought, let me check with you. So my, my idea was I was just going to kind of turn off my camera, lurk in the background and kind of, I don't know. Um, do you need me to do anything or I can just... Uh oh, I can't. Yeah, right. You you would not think that I had not done this for a whole year, right? The year we <laughs> shut down. I, I was going to start off with just a, a good evening introduction and thanking you and the Menard Center, and then welcoming our 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 guests, our attendees, and then move into doing some bio background for our panelists, and then just getting them started with just a list of random questions and so forth, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I'll just stay out of the way. So, yeah, Thank I'm good. With that. Yeah. Do we know how many attendees we have? Eleven is not bad. I was like pumped no. about that. No, we're at thirty something. Oh. Um, let me check. Oh, I'm afraid to check because it may knock us all off the. Off Don't worry us. then. So, yeah. It's a 50 50 chance things go very badly if I if I try to check that. So let's not check. OK, <laughs> I, I when you said 11, I was like, that's really a nice intimate oh, yeah. audience. Yeah. And and I know we'll we'll very likely end up with more than that because I have um, I've been getting emails in the past hour or so, which is not atypical. Um, so how do I log into this thing? Yeah. So, you know, so, yeah, that's that's great. OK, yeah. well. I lectured today for a colleague in a class of 12, and it's the first time in my career that I've ever worn jeans. I had heels on to lecture, and I sat down and I lectured, and I had a blast. So yeah. I'm thinking I'm going to do that in my own That's, class. Uh, yeah, I just discovered a new mode here. I yeah. did. Yeah. It's called comfort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have to be uncomfortable up there talking to them, but yeah. Absolutely had a blast doing that, lecturing to them and comfortable and talking. So, yeah. yeah. Now, the Zoom thing, we've all kind of learned how to do this. And, uh, and it, although I have not learned that sort of I should probably not have the spotlights on over my head. Oh. Yeah, but... But my camera's gonna be off anyway, so yeah. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna turn mine off after I introduce everybody and just let the panelists, um, you know, have their camera on and so forth. Because I remember when this started, this the issues of bandwidth. You couldn't have, you know, people would say, "Would you cut your camera on your your audio off because of bandwidth?" Yeah, but it's 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 become a pretty effective tool. We're we're hosting a couple, of, so we are. Um, co-sponsoring with the League of Women Voters and the Journal News, and then a uh, about a dozen other organizations, Chambers of Commerce and, and so forth. Uh, we're doing three debates 
Mm -hmm. uh, later starting the end of September and into October. And we'll do them on Zoom. And that, you know, we started that a couple of years ago and it turns out it's it's fine. Um, because a lot more people attend the debates if they can, you know, do it that way. So ease of access for them. Yeah. Yeah. I may send Kaolani a quick email um, because she's uh, in Pacific time. So I'm just going to double check with her to let her know that we're going to start in a few minutes. So, so Becky, I'm curious, what, so what do you do there at the, I, I've read your bio on the, the website, but like, what, does what your day look like typically? Uh, a lot of computer stuff. Um, I, so we're currently like working to end the death penalty in Ohio. So I do a lot yeah. of grassroots organizing, I run meetings, um, and then I do a lot of education um, pieces as well, like um, through a couple of other programs we have. So do you have any sense of sort of where the politics are going with the death penalty? Like, do you feel like you're beating your head against a wall or do you feel like, <laughs> like, like did, uh, you know? Like, um, yeah. we, we are actually really hopeful that we would pass legislation this year to end the death penalty. But um, uh, unfortunately, due to the um, redistricting and everything that's happening, a lot of things have just like hit a wall. Where we've had we have like bipartisan support on the bill, um, and it's like been we've had a record like it's like a record movement this year, um, but just a matter of hitting the legislature at the right time essentially. So we'll have to reintroduce next session, but um, we've done a lot of work and we're hopeful it can happen. But you are you're picking up Republican support. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 But probably. The election year i don't want to be labeled as soft on crime so I'll election you, year yeah you know, i'll tell you secretly i support it but i won't say anything yeah that's kind of a lot we'll get and like i support it but i'm not going to like work to move my colleagues or anything like that yeah yeah relatively soul crushing um <laughs> but, but it is it is what it is yeah oh yeah yeah there's all this like politics too about the Senate, the majority is not going to bring a bill to the floor that's going to split their party and yeah, all that kind of stuff too. So. so much of sort of everything boils down to gerrymandering and yeah, you know, like it's it is, I think, the source of most of our problems. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Including candidates who don't want to debate. And if I were, you know, <laughs> and frankly, if I were working for them, you know, and if you're up 25 points in a gerrymandered district, why bother? Yeah. So, yeah. Why would, yeah. Why would you bother? More soul crushing. This is just depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My poor kids hear it all the time from me of like, yeah, we're doomed, but hey, let's get back to work. So, yeah. John, are you originally from Ohio? Is this your home? Yeah, I, well, I grew up about 20 miles east of Columbus. So, oh. yeah, so not this area. The, you know, it's, it's interesting. The politics of this area, so much different from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, although the politics of where I grew up is different from when I was growing up, too. Um, yeah, and it's it's the classic sort of story of, blue collar democratic areas that are now Trump dominated areas. And um, yeah. Kaylani's having a hard time logging in. Uh, she, I wonder if she like tried to log in from the um, Google chat because tell her to use um, John, like the, the link that John emailed us. Cause I tried to do that at first too. Oh. Hang on one minute. She's saying it's not letting me in. So I'll say use the link that yeah. John sent you.
Well, we have, um, we are not in a practice room. Apparently the room is open. Mm -hmm. oh, I also did. Oh, okay. Is that not, is that okay? Oh, sure, sure. And what I'll do is I'll just, yeah, as we're getting close to seven o'clock, I'll just turn off my camera and, and wish you all, yeah, a good conversation. I think it will go well. What is she saying? I am in, it is saying this, huh? Oh. oh, yeah, that it's giving her, John, it's giving her the Miami University login page. Okay, let me um, let me send her another okay. invitation and hopefully that will take care of the problem. Let me try that. Okay, I just resent the invitation. So hopefully, yeah, that shouldn't require a Miami login. Dominique also needs, she said, I'm ready. I cannot find the link. Is there one? I just, I just sent it to her too. So it should it should pop up in her email right now. Ah, that's that's progress. Sorry about that. No problem. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. So participants are joining. And we'll wait a few minutes for Dominique. John, he wants she wanted to know if you spelled her name correctly. Because she evidently didn't receive it. Okay. Um it's Dominique Jones. Let me take a look here. Okay. We'll get started in a few minutes for our attendees. So thank you for your patience. 
Uh, it's the, well, let me run the email address by you. It's D-O-M-I-N-I-Q-U-E at D-B-I-N-O-L-A dot org. Okay, hang on one minute. Yes, D-B-I-N-O-L-A dot org. Yes. Yeah. And it's just Dominique at dbinola.org. Is that okay, correct? Hang on one minute. Let me see. Um, it's Dominique at dbinola.org. Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. And D-O-M-I-N-I-Q-U-E. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it's in there. Mm -hmm. okay. Could you resend for her maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I just reset it again. So she ought to have she ought to have a couple of them in her email box at this point. Well, I'd like us to go ahead and get started and then she can, Dominique can join when she gets the chance. And if she shoots me an email, John, I'll kind of um, send you an email in terms of following up with her. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Yvette Harris and I'm a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology at Miami University. And I'm also the director of Miami University's Center for the Study and Support of Children and Families of the Incarcerated. And I wanna thank everyone for attending our panel discussion on front lines working with children and families of the incarcerated. I'd like to also thank Dr. John Foran, Chair of the Department of Justice and Community Studies and Executive Director of the Mar Menard, uh, Miami University's Menard Family Center for Democracy. And I'd also like to take a few minutes to thank our panelists. And I wanna start off by going over the bios of our panelists. We've got a really great group of women who are doing phenomenal things with children and families of the uh, incarcerated. I wanna start off by introducing Becky Baker, and she's the program manager for the death penalty and peace and nonviolence at Intercommunity Just and Peace Center. Becky has a BS in journalism with minors in environmental studies and geography from Ohio University and a master's of social work from the University of South Carolina. She is, she is an AmeriCorps alum who spent years working in Appalachian, Ohio at a nonprofit, creating local food access and fighting for food justice, and then expanded her advocacy and community organizing skills with Save the Children Action Network, working to secure funding for early childhood education programs. Becky has experience working with marginalized communities and families facing incarceration from working directly with families in foster care, and as a school social worker in Price Hill. Currently, she organizes a pen pal program for people on death row and advocates for ending the death penalty in Ohio. Becky Baker, thank you and welcome. I wanna introduce Dominique Jones Johnson, who's trying to come in with us. Hang on one minute, I just got an email from her. Uh, I don't have this, the link to sign in. Can you please drop it in here? I checked my spam. Uh, John. She also sent you an email as well. Uh, so she CC'd you on that as well. So Dominique is, is, is uh, joining us in a few minutes and she is the child of an incarcerated parent, an advocate for kids with incarcerated parents and the founder of Daughters Beyond Incarceration and Parenting from Prison. A native of New Orleans, Dominique is an expert on trauma due to parental incarceration. She's dedicated to educating communities on best practices for shifting paradigms and creating safe and supportive environments for children living with an incarcerated parent to decrease trauma-related stress and anxiety and nurture success. Often called upon to speak on panels, Dominique uses platforms available to her to raise the consciousness of, pub of the public on the hardships CIPs live with. She's been featured on Gambit Weekly, uh, NBC News, Dateline, 
and Sight Magazine to list a few. In 2007, When Are You Coming Home? An exploratory essay confronting the issues involving children with incarcerated parents and how to break the cycle was published in the Loyola Law Review. Mrs. Johnson is a fellow of the Youth Justice Leadership Institute of, of the, I'm sorry, I just got an email in and it just it kind of, I'm sorry, um, took my attention away. She's a fellow of the Youth Just Justice Leadership Institute, Power Correlation Coalition. She leads and Citizen She, she shows up and was release, recently awarded uh, City Businesswoman of the Year. Dominique is a graduate of Warren Easton Senior High School. She earned a bachelor's degree from Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama on a full track and field scholarship and a master's in human resource education with a specialization in organizational leadership from LSU. Welcome to uh, Dominique when you're able to join us. Kealani Walker is founder of FOTI, Families of the Incarcerated. Since 2016, Kealani and her leadership team have joined thousands of families across the nation to build trust and unity by forming over 37 Facebook pages for support. As a wife of an incarcerated individual who is currently housed in Washington, Kealani strives to empower communities that are impacted by incarceration by bringing awareness to the unjust uh, justice system. She advocates for proper rehabilitation for the civil rights of individuals affected by imprisonment, for holding the government accountable to writing and crafting uh, current policy, for abolishing a solitary confinement and being a voice for ending the stigma of incarceration. Kailani has partnered with Viapath Technology to create a new smartphone application to help families and friends nav navigate the judicial journey. Kealani is building a website that will be a one-stop shop of resources for anyone impacted by incar incarceration. The two platforms are scheduled to launch by the end of 2022. Thank you so much. Welcome, Dominique. I just introduced you and welcome to our panel. Uh, I wanna start off um, by asking just some general questions and then uh, attendees, feel free to put questions in the chat for Becky, Kealani, and Dominique. Um, I wanna start off with just, again, a few questions. Discuss the work you do and who do you work with? We'll start off with Kealani. Discuss the work you do and who do you work with? Um, I work with families across the nation to um, really bring awareness to what we endure daily in the life of someone being incarcerated. Um, and uh, we do have an organization, so it is called FOTI, Families of the Incarcerated. So um, that is who we represent. Becky. Yeah, so um, I work at Intercommunity Justice and Peace Center. We're based in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, but some of our work is like statewide. Um, some, some of our work is nationwide. We're an education and advocacy organization. Uh, we work in three main issue areas, and one of mine is the death penalty. Um, and in that realm, I do uh, I work with folks who are directly on who are on Ohio's death row. So there's about 130 people on death row. I don't work with all of them, um, but we run a pen pal pro program for those folks. Um, for some of the guys who have ongoing appeals cases, uh, we are there as um, figures of support. Um, we worked with a few other people who have um, been released from death row. Um, and yeah, that's a pertaining to that. That's what a lot of my work centers on. Um, as uh, an organization, we also work on immigration and ending human traffic trafficking. And we do this all through a framework of peace and nonviolence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dominique. Hello, everyone. My name is Dominique Johnson, and I am the founder of Daughters Beyond Incarceration. We work to enhance the lives of girls that are directly impacted by incarceration, and we do that through mentorship, um, public education, support, and advocacy. We are shifting our focus to raise awareness to the racial inequalities that exist among girls that are impacted by incarceration by um, increasing our public policy and enhancing the overall comprehension skills um, within the children in our city, I should say, that are struggling directly um, 
because of their parents' incarceration. Thank you. And I'm just going to punt this out to any of you can jump in and answer the next question. Um, how'd you actually get started in the, the work that you're doing? How'd you get started? Dominique, you want to go ahead? Uh, then I'll go ahead and identify. I'll go first. Dominique, you want to go ahead? Um, in April of 1982, my father um, came home and was, my mom told him, hey, we're having a baby. Um, so being extremely excited, he, you know, they shared their joy. Um, she asked him to go out and get her something that she was craving, and she never seen him again. The state of Louisiana ripped my life apart because my Black father looked like another Black man. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole in June of 1982. I was born November of 1982. So the first time I met my father was behind prison bars. We started DBI because from the year of 2000 through 2007, or I'm sorry, 2004, we didn't talk. We didn't know how to bridge that communication gap that, that, lack, that was between us because we were unable to communicate our feelings. My dad always looked at me as his little baby girl and it was extremely impossible for him to be able to have a conversation with me to tell me, his daughter, that a white woman accused him of rape. Um, and so when he did, we realized that this is a common thread amongst so many children um, right in my community. And um, to make sure that we help support those children, we started DBI. Becky. Um, honestly, I, it's hard to think of like just pinpoint one, one thing that's really started me on this path. Um, but uh, back when I joined AmeriCar and I started working with um, families who were in extreme poverty um, and I was working in social and uh, social welfare um, and children's services and uh, families in foster care, I just started to feel like I was part of the system and part of this uh, circle and cycle that just um, continues to um, continues to harm people based on generational poverty um, that we weren't really doing a whole lot to help. And um, I spent um, I spent one summer driving kids from Athens, Ohio, up to um, the Ohio, the women's prison um, to visit their mom in jail. And, um, and then I just was like, I, this, I can't be part of the system anymore. I have to figure out how to, how to actually change things. And so I went and got my graduate degree in social work. And um, since from then, I've always been hopeful and working like, like in policy change, as well as um, working within communities and building community. Um, and that's kind of how I came to where I am now. Um, policy work is slow moving. All of this is, is all slow moving, um, but it's still great to be able to work with folks and try to build community around things that we all value and care about. So it's kind of a little story about how I got to where I am, um, but yeah. Kaylani, how about you? Um, I actually started this journey in 2016 when my husband uh, was uh, actually sentenced to uh, prison. And um, how I actually started to gain my passion was really the first day that I stepped foot on the facility grounds here in Washington. And I noticed how um, I was being treated as well as other um, visitors were being treated and the difference between, um, because my husband was housed in California as well, um, it was just a huge difference of how we as humans were being treated. And um, for me, uh, to be honest, it triggered a little bit of my my childhood. And I think that's why I became more passionate because of the abuse of power. And um, so from there, it just grew. And we started out with nine members in 2016 on one of our Facebook pages. And now we have thousands across the nation. Um, and we do policy work as well. Um, 
Uh, and for us, it's just really to do what's right. Um, so that is what brought me here was my husband is incarcerated currently. What about any particular challenges that I'm going to do my video, I'm going to turn my video back on, but what about any particular challenges that you all have in terms of working with the system, working within the system, working for crafting policy, even working with CFIs, what are the particular challenges that you all have? And then I'll also ask you about successes as well, but could you identify some of the particular challenges that you might have? Dominique, yes. Um, I think, so when I step into the room, the biggest challenge that I have is, along with being seen, is being respected. Because people feel like children that live in low-income communities in New Orleans or people who are product of New Orleans parish school system, we lack the knowledge or the business acumen to debate, to develop the skills to, to lead this work. So the biggest challenge is trying to get them to respect the lived experiences. There are so many doctors, there's so many lawyers and researchers and scientists doing this work, right? Mm -hmm. But how many of them are directly impacted? Mm -hmm. And the stories that we tell are completely different. Mm -hmm. And trying to get them to understand that our life is not going to always be able to be read in a textbook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it is hard. And so sometimes I have to go in the room and I have to go in the room loud and I have to go in the room boisterous and I have to go in the room deep. And um, lucky for them that I'm not afraid to do that, but it is, um, it is extremely challenging because I don't always wanna be seen in that light. Mm -hmm. um, another challenge is having someone who's not from the community do the work and get the credit for the work that we're doing. Yeah. Um, so we want, we partnered with Angola State Penitentiary, which is where my father is housed at, to create um, a children and families handbook. In the handbook, once we redid it, it was developed by caregivers, youth, and myself, and along with my co-founder. But initially before that, it was crafted, it was crafted by someone from New York. And I said, New York can't tell you what it looks like or what it means to to raise a child that's impacted by incarceration in Louisiana, because Louisiana is different. So, um, it, it and, and, and as a black woman, I don't always get the ability to be included in conversations. I don't get to be there at the beginning phase. And um, it, it, it hurts when I am bought in. We just wanna know your thoughts on this. And then when I respond and they don't like the way I respond, we get something totally different. So it's just a constant battle of ensuring that we are being included and, um, and that the children that I bring with me, their voices are heard too, because a real authentic New Orleanian teenager will tell you, Ms. Dominique can't respond for me. I'm 16, she's not. What about Becky? Thank you, Dominique. What about Becky and Keolani? What about the challenges for you all? Similar to Dominique's in a sense. And I like this focus of the voice of those who are having the lived experiences because too often it's, it's much more academic. So what about you all? Um, for me, I feel that the challenges are uh, just the stigma of incarceration. Um, as being a family member, you're looked at, in my eyes, as a criminal. Um, and it's really hard because, uh, you know, I am no different um, to many that, to, I'm just talking in specifics of advocacy, because um, I'm no different than the other person. Um, but there are so many, uh, it's almost like a, the challenges that I face is trying to bring change, um, but also, uh, but not feeling like you're educated enough, I guess that, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, being someone that is a wife of an incarcerated individual, um, the challenges of being able to bring awareness to the public itself can be a little hard because 
uh, people look at prison as a bad thing. Like, oh, that person. And, you know, when I tell people that my husband's in prison, the first thing they say is, why is he there? Did he murder someone? I mean, it's an instant reaction of bad. And um, those are the challenges that I find. And also being an advocate for what we do. Um, we also, I get, uh, I really do get beat up a lot in this world. Um, and it it's uh, it can be defeating at times because of the fact that we, we would think that everybody think, looks through the same lens of humanity, but that's not the case. And it's really, really, really sad. So those are some of the challenges that we face as families. Becky? Yeah, I would um, add that. I, lawyers are not easy people to deal with either. And they often do not have the um, empathy scope or to deal with folks that um, is needed. And there's also just a lot of jargon and just the court system in general. Um, and uh, when you have somebody who's working on the case, especially if somebody's wrongfully convicted, because we, because once you're convicted of a crime, it is ex it is nearly impossible to be exonerated. And um, just, I get emails from guys all the time who are just so frustra frustrated and fed up with their lawyers. And I just think that if the lawyers took some time and I get emails from lawyers who are also frustrated that like the, the, the person that they're working with is so frustrated, but I'm just like, can you imagine sitting in jail? I'm working with a man now who's just had his hearing to see if he's going to get a new trial um, for a murder. He's on death row. And he, can you imagine sitting in there for almost 30 years for something you didn't do? Um, so just think working with lawyers for one and trying to like give that space for like the emotional capacity to understand what it means to be inside some, a place like that for that long. And then just like the system policies and processes in general. Um, I know both like both uh, Kaylani and Dominique mentioned like the stigma. Um, no one cares about people in prison. Um, no one cares. Like if you're advocating for people in prison, no one, no one cares. Um, they're, they're overheated. They have no air conditioning. Um, I imagine in Louisiana, it's also extremely, extremely hot. Um, so they have like their temperatures in their cells are like 90 something degrees and they have limited time outdoors. Um, they have to purchase every, purchase everything. Um, every single thing they have people on death row, even more, uh, they aren't allowed to have the same job as other people. And even that you have to pay to visit, you have to pay to do almost pay to talk to them, pay to visit them. And people in Ohio don't even get their physical letters anymore. They just get it on a screen. Um, so we've just really cut, just really just like cut that off. And even just like, I get phone, like working with people who are older and don't understand technology and everything on the visiting system is like through like, you have to sign up and get an account and then you have to go through and click all these buttons to get a visit. Um, so it's just complicated. It's complicated to figure out. Um, and I was sitting, um, I was talking with someone who is um, in the holding cell for court. And so we are on a video screen, his video paused for like three minutes. And I remember the woman behind me and she was on she was on the phone and I could hear all the other people on the phone too. And I listened to every single person was just talking up until the very last minute. They didn't like really wait for goodbyes. just like talking as much as they could until the last minute. Um, and it's, it's hard if, if, even if you don't have the money to get down there um, or you're driving out to the middle of nowhere town to go try and see this person on this one day. So really, and policies change in the prison system every five years. They review the policies like every five in Ohio. Um, every five years. So I would just say, yeah, <laughs> those are some major challenges I see. Well, I think related to what all three of you said, John asked in the chat, what sort of policy changes would you all like, you know, to be made? And then what role can the federal government play in, in making sure those policy changes happen? Oh, gosh. If I could, if I could just say, I mean, I, that's a great question, John. Um, you know, uh, we, FOTI is actually uh, doing our first initiative this year um, and we're really excited about it. And one thing that we struggle with is honestly is transparency and accountability. So a question like that is hard um, 
I love it. And I could have a whole list of things for you for policy changes. And I'd love to email you about it. Um, but it's the accountability to the policy. That's what I would love to see some kind of entity out of the government's hands, to be honest, to hold uh, these departments accountable to the policies that are written by law, if that makes sense. A separate governing body, is that right, Keolani, who oversees prisons, but it's independent of the federal government? Yeah. Yes. Becky, Dominique, policy changes. Thoughts on that? Um, I would, right now in Ohio, we're trying to pass bail reform um, so that people aren't just held in prison indefinitely um, or able to just get out that bail. You Sitting in prison shouldn't be, you shouldn't be able to get out just because you have money. Um, that You shouldn't have to sit in prison waiting just because you can't pay X amount to get out and you're not even guilty yet. So why are we holding people in prison um, like that? That's one thing I can think of. Um, I think there needs to be better transparency for how prisons are run. Um, I would end the privatization of prisons because it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, and I would also change some like visiting policies. I think that there needs to be like, if you have a child, there needs to be like an, a certain amount that you are allotted for your child. Um, those are a few things I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> Think. Oh, John. Yeah. Um, so first off, it is always, always, always important to keep families together. There is no reason that um, a person can be incarcerated in one city and state and their family live miles and miles away. That is extremely financially challenging on families, but it's also damaging to a child's mental um, and emotional well-being. Um, and secondly, when my father get got arrested the state of Louisiana signed on as his caregiver. However, I can't get life insurance on him. So if he dies, their policy is to call you, your father passed away, you have X amount of days to come pick up his body, but I can't get life insurance on him. So there should be some type of law that the federal government can do to one, you took my income away, then you provide that income to me. Two, you, my father or my or whoever, whomever, God forbid, um, has now died. You need to have some type of scholarship or some type of endowment fund to help support me with burial expenses because I want to give my person um, a proper burial. And they shouldn't have to be buried on your plantation. Um, and also support, work with organizations to support um, the children or the families holistically. There should be no reason that because a person is incarcerated, they can't attend parent-teacher conference, or they can't um, virtually attend a graduation. If that child is okay with it, set up a system to support that child. I think if we think about how prisons are actually meant to um, rehabilitate, then I think we'll have a better outcome um, of how, children's, how children understand and deal with incarceration. And because we don't have better systems in place, are better policies in place than you have children um, having a strike in crime. <laughs> um, you have children dropping out of schools and children with incarcerated parents um, are dropping out of school at a much higher rate than their peers here in Louisiana. Um, I would also like to see those policies implemented and enforced by people with lived experiences. So the government could also use their support so the government could create funds to support the children, the people who are impacted by incarceration. And when you think about the work that we do, so for me, I don't have any way, anywhere to go when I'm helping one of my girl's father come home and my dad is still there. I have to continue to do the work and there's no outlet for me. So I think that there should be some type of credit for time served based on the work that your loved one is doing to raise awareness in the free world. I, I, I don't know, that's just me. I'm still thinking through that, but I definitely think that we should have some type of support um, at the time of debt 
Um, they should also be able to attend graduations virtually and um, parent-teacher conference because just because you're incarcerated doesn't mean that you should lose your child's a place in your child's life. Thanks, Dominique. Um, so I've got a couple of questions that I'll read to you from the, the chat. The first one comes from Johnny Jackson. What role does prison abolition play in your work? And can you talk about your dream for the 3 million children of incarcerated parents and their, friend, their families? Great work, y'all. So what role does prison abolition play in your work? I can, I can, oh, go ahead, Dominique. No, 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 go ahead. Um, well, for me, um, Johnny, thanks for the question. I actually um, thought about, uh, about um, being an abol, I can't ever say that word. Abol Abolitionist. 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 And I actually uh, read about a famous abolitionist, to be honest, and I wanted to be, be able to educate myself on that because at one point mm -hmm. I really did want to abolish prisons. I didn't feel that the structure or uh, there was no rehabilitation that was happening in the prisons. So I was like, why, why are we creating more, um, how do I say this? Like it's, I feel like without rehabilitation, the communities are not safe. So why would we want to have art? Because in Washington, we're a state facility, so we're not federal. But why would we want as taxpayers to be going to uh, facilities um, that were not uh, that were not doing that was not giving uh, people a, uh, rehabilitation? Um, but I do believe in law and justice, to be honest with you. So to abolish um prisons altogether um i can i i wouldn't i wouldn't be great at that um just because i do believe in law and justice but if it was if there was a way i think that i would be part of that and i'd be loud like dominique i'd be real loud voice in uh, abolishing and then about my dream for three million children of incarcerated parents oh my gosh Let's build Disneyland's at all the prisons so they can go and it's a happy place. Um, yeah, so that's great questions. Thank you. Becky, Dominique. Dominique, I think you were next. Were you going to talk a little bit about that next? And I, I have mean, some other questions too. And just to echo what Kehlani said, I grew up in prison. And so some of the same people that I've seen for 40 years still remember me as a baby in Pampers. They are Uncle Duck, Uncle Joe, Big Brother Tim, because these people, are, um, they've been there with my father. And I think, I think the way we, we the, the way the prisons create visitation, it makes it look, it, it, it is hard. There's nothing to do. Um, there's two video game stations. Um, the crayons and pencils and board games are all broken up. Um, I remember trying to take my eight-year-old, my now eight-year-old there for the first time and she wanted to bring in, I'm sorry, she said she's nine and a half, yeah, eight and a half. Um, and she wanted to bring her Elmo and they told her that she couldn't bring the Elmo. Even after they stripped it and ripped it apart, she couldn't bring it. But for her, the sound of the prison bars were hard and she needed something to keep her safe while she endured that sound. So for me, um, I think the prison should actually turn into rehabilitation centers. I think they should actually do what their intentions are and that is to rehabilitate. Because when you think about how powerful a person can be to endure 10, 20, 30, 40 years in prison, come home and manage to live a resourceful, productive life. Think about how smart and how powerful you are. And you're doing that without any rehabilitation services. So if that prison was actually a rehabilitation center, then we would already have systems in place to support their families because you would already have a system in place to help um, connect that family together. And you wouldn't have outside services creating um, 
Children's Day or our uh, Mommy's Day or, or, or whatever. Because if it's a rehabilitation center, it would already be family oriented. And we wouldn't have to do that. Um, and I just think that, you know, I envision a world where people are actually arrested for the crimes that they commit and not crimes that they look like the person that did it. I wish that Black people were not targeted. And I just wish that we were able to protect families. Thank you, Dominique. Becky. Um, yeah, I, I, I would not say that my organization say holds us to you, but I am, uh, I've definitely fallen to the camp of prison abolitionist. Um, our work, but my work at an organization does center on this idea. Like we don't believe in the death penalty. One of the reasons we don't is because there, there's that hope for redemption um, that people, you know, there's opportunity. We are all human, um, you know, and uh, I just hope that we are able to um, provide people with what they need so that we don't need prisons to exist in the first place. Um, a lot of our behaviors stem from unmet needs. And if our needs were met, we wouldn't, um, you know, be seeing so many behaviors. So it'd be my hope that we are living and working to a world that is um, built on restorative justice and transformative justice and a place where we um, know how to handle conflict amongst one another. Um, and yeah, that, this, that would be the pipe dream. And like, as things do get hard, really hard, and I, you know, um, I think that's the hope, you know, you have to keep imagining what that world could be. Um, and yeah. Catherine Antti, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, she, she is asking this question. Statistically, there's around 12 to 15% of incarcerated people are innocent in the United States. Due to lawyers who only want money or if pro bono, the trials are not fair or regulated according to the statutes of the Constitu Constitution. Sixth Amendment is constantly violated. There is there is incompetent defense. And if there is no witness called for the defense, then the person who's charged has no hope. This should be unacceptable for all justice systems. And then I think, Catherine, you go on to ask a question about how your, and the question just disappeared. But the question is, um, how can, um, I guess it's a relative who is living in one state have contact with a son who's living in Louisiana, where the, um, the mother does not allow the son to um, visit the father? So I guess, Catherine, you're asking a little bit more about visitation. Is that right? I can help her in any way I can, um, depending on what part of Louisiana is in. And I'm also willing to talk to the mom that lives in Washington. Most of the time, um, the, the person that the incarcerated person is with, I'm sorry, Dr. Harris. No, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The person that the incarcerated person is with, um, is left with so many unanswered questions mm -hmm. and rightfully so they are bitter. My mother, um, she never seen my father. She asked him to go get her a bag of chips, um, a pig lip and a Hawaiian punch. And she never seen him again. And though so she was stuck raising his child. So we had an extremely tough time um, developing and forming a relationship because she saw him and me. So I think um, one of the hardest things to do is to bridge that gap with the mother. But I think also depending on where the son is living in Louisiana and where the incarcerated father is housed at, um, Catherine, I would help to support you in that if they are in a different parish. Um, then I have a pretty popular um, friend group of this incarceration family. So I would definitely um, connect you with someone that um, that can help you. But that's the one thing that you can do. Write letters to someone that supports um, them communicating. Um, and you can also um, sign up for, um, I think it's called Angel Tree, A-N-G-E-L-T-R-E-E. -E -E. They used to send me gifts mm -hmm. from when I was a baby until 18, and they would deliver them on Christmas Day. And let me tell you, 
that made me so happy because it, there's a process now that when my dad explains it to you. So like Christmas is in December, this is September, say October, they're starting at now. Mm-hmm. It's starting at now. And it just, and now and as an adult, it makes me feel good to know that my dad took out the time to make sure that they deliver my gift on Christmas day. And they say, we have a gift for Dominique from your dad. And I just, I felt so happy. I want to know about successes that you've had, because then I have a, a question that I want to ask too about advice for people interested in starting organizations. But so we've talked about the challenges and how do you, would you define success? Certainly what, what have successes been like for you and, and how do you define those successes? Um, I can go. Um, I think for me, one of my biggest uh, successes is um, really to help empower others. Um, You know, when I started this a while ago, um, it was really hard for uh, others to join in the efforts because of retaliation. It's a real thing. And people fear that in the system. So to be a voice, um, It was really hard for others to uh, raise their voices because they were afraid that their loved ones would be retaliated inside the prisons, as well as we as families being retaliated against. Um, I think the success of it is that um, I now have 17 people on my leadership team that are leaders and they are they're amazing people and they live this experience and they're giving Um, others guidance to walk through this and, um, you know, um, to be able to know that you are changing people's lives by just someone sending you a message saying, thank you for getting me out of a dark place. And thank you for the support that you've given me is a success for me personally. Um, because, um, support is really huge on this journey. The trauma so I look at it like the, that incarceration is caused, I feel, by trauma that's not taken care of. And I could be wrong. I'm not as I'm not I don't, I'm not educated on all of this, but I do believe that incarceration itself causes trauma, not only to the individual, but to us, us as families. Um, and so we we Voti actually has three um, calls a week and we do a support group night where others can come and join and talk about um, things that's, um, you know, venting and things like that. And I guess for me, uh, you know, ultimately the success is to be able to take the fear and the anxiety away from others to be able to give them the guidance and the awareness so they don't have to go through what we had to go through. So it's just bringing change. I guess that's for me, that's my success. Becky. Yeah, I would, I'd say like slightly sim, sim, similar, Ugh, sorry. Um, we send uh, birthday cards and holiday cards to everybody on death row, like regularly every year. And, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you want to like, are they getting these? Like, does this is matter? But then every once in a while you get a, a letter back that says, you guys have been sending me cards for this long. Thank you so much. Like, I appreciate it. Um, and I think too, just like, again, the social worker in me is just like those relationships you build, um, are, you know, I think pretty cool and important. Um, this woman I work with Sue has been writing, uh, to people. Sure. She had an experience where her husband was incarcerated and, um, she saw how messed up the system was. And since then she's been writing to men um, who are in prison and working with them and, uh, uh, getting to see some people get finally get released. She has some of their furniture at her house. Um, so those stories are things and things to me are success. Those relationships you see built, um, in a few weeks, Derek Jameson, who's an Ohio death row exoneree will be coming back. Um, just, he's another black guy that was just picked up because he's in the wrong place, the wrong time. He's alibi was even that he was with the cops at the time that the, um, murder took place. Um, he'll be back in a few weeks and just the people to come talk to everybody and just the people in um, 
seeing him and like just knowing what he went through. He was like hours away from death at one point. Um, his like positivity is absolutely insane. Um, and just, I don't know, getting to talk with him and just having those relationships again. I feel like I'm rambling, but I think those are the successes to me. And especially with kids, when you're able to help kids work through some of those emotions um, and really just like explaining that there's a difference between bad choices and being a bad person. Um, I've heard so many kids say to me, I'm bad, I'm bad. I'm like, no, that's no, like that's not a thing. Um, so really just when kids finally get that is also, I think, a success that happens. Dominique. Um, organizationally, I would say the success is definitely finding the girls that actually believe in you and want to learn from you. Um, it is also um, an accomplishment when you work with a girl or girls for so long and their incarcerated loved one comes home and that bond that you help them create is sustained. And so when they come home, they're able to just pick up um, because they've been communicating for such a long time. And um, just to be a part of their journey is very heartwarming. It is also, um, it is also very successful to feel that people believe in your work, that they fund you. Um, that's happy, that makes it feel good. Um, this is my full-time job and, um, you know, I, I enjoy it. Um, I guess individually, just the ability to, to walk in a room, to tell my story, and to have people so intrigued about something that I didn't choose and still have the ability to discuss that, um, that's an accomplishment. And I would say the, the biggest success, success has to be um, passing a bill. Um, you know, we created Louisiana's first ever council for children of incarcerated parents and caregivers. And um, we did that while I was pregnant with twins. And it was a fight. <laughs> and um, it brought out so many challenges but the overall outcome was a huge success and I was extremely proud of it. Two last questions for you. One is, and this comes from Sidra, uh, how can students get involved in working with CFIs? And then, uh, then I'll have my last question for you. So how can students get involved in working with CFIs? Anyone can jump in at any time. Um, I can quickly go first. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a pen pal, you can, uh, to somebody on death row in Ohio, um, you can feel free to email me. Um, there's also lots of different organizations that uh, who do work within prisons. If you're interested in working directly with folks in prison who do different programming. Um, yeah, sorry, that's all I, my brain went off, but yeah. Those are mine too. Um, I actually put my email address in under your question. I would I would be honored if you would contact me. Um, you know, we've contacted a lot of the colleges in our area because it does kind of start with you guys as as students to make change and uh anything that we can do to give you our lived experiences, because hopefully our lived experiences would um, you know, help with the help with uh you being part of changing the system so um we would love for you to if you if you would contact me i'd love for you to sit on a leadership meeting with boti um and that's a great question thank you so much for being interested and involved so um i would i always tell the students at tulane university to find a community that you plan to work in and join people in that community that are that are doing the same fight. You know, there's a lot of people in New Orleans that are boots on the ground with mass incarceration. And it is important that you find your lane in that. If that is specifically women or men or children 
or even mothers of children, find that lane, get those people and work with those people. And it's very important that you become okay with using your voice and your power to support them. And that doesn't mean supporting them in front of them. It means supporting them behind them or on the side of them um, to actually uplift and amplify their voice. Um, I think that in, in doing the work with them, you'll learn, you'll learn the, the words that are dehumanized and that are not safe to use. Um, you'll learn how to have better communication with people who are formerly incarcerated and how to directly approach them. Um, and you'll learn the signs and symptoms of children who are impacted by incarceration just by spending time with and around them and with their families. One last question for you all, and, and please attendees, feel free to put a few more questions in the chat if you'd like. What kind of advice would you give to people who are interested in starting programs similar to the ones that you all um, are working with? What kind of advice? We sorely need something in Butler County, um, but what kind of, Butler County, Ohio, what kind of advice would you provide to people? Um, generally overall, uh, I would make sure that the, whatever you're planning is, uh, led by like the people who are impacted or the people like you're asking what they want, um, not just like starting something and then doing it, um, because you can start a support group and no one's going to show up if they don't feel like it's something they need. Um, also like, it's not about I guess my thing too is like never about generally overall, it's like never about really saving people. It's about creating community. I would always make that the focus that you're creating community um, and to build from that foundation um, and like setting boundaries. And I don't mean like necessarily like just like know what you are planning to do and don't offer more than you're willing to do, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, those are my general thoughts on that. I can go, Kalani. Um, to just echo what Becky said, um, I, I'm kind of have a bias against people that start or um, do the work and are not impacted. Um, I appreciate it, but since since I've been doing this work. Um, I feel like you don't know what it's like to, to go through a natural disaster and have to worry about yourself and have to worry about your incarcerated loved one. So how can you tell my story? How can you do that through a nonprofit? That's extremely challenging and it's kind of unfair because you didn't feel my feelings. You didn't feel my emotions. You didn't endure my pain and you didn't help me pay for those financial um, costs that I endured. And so I think, um, I, and I wouldn't even encourage you to create a space. I would say to join a space. It is very important that you um, work to support people who are doing this work. And if you're trying to do something and you don't have the actual lived experience, then maybe you should refocus your experience and how you can use that to support them. Um, I love, love, love researchers. I love when I get the emails from college students or graduate schools to say, hey, I'm writing a research paper, can you help me? Yes, yes, I will help you because um, we need the data. We don't have data that describes the percentage of children here in Louisiana. So every time I get those emails, I jump on it. But I would encourage you to find your niche and um, and stick to it because it's hard. I mean, we don't get the the actual funding as a black led nonprofit that we should, and to, we don't even get the funding from Louisiana. Uh, we have one, maybe two funding companies in New Orleans, and the bulk of our funding comes from out of state. So it's definitely a fight for black led nonprofits, and I would encourage you to find your niche in the area that you're looking for, and build off of that. Caroline? 
Um, I'm all about empowering each other. I think that, um, you know, I, I do echo what Dominique and Becky um, state. It's for me, I'm all about transparency. So um, when I started this uh, journey, I think it's important that um, uh, when you do, if you do decide to do a support group of any sorts, that you be fully transparent. Um, if you are forming a political group, let that be known. Um, if you are doing it for intentions of being able to get funding, let that be known. Um, and so um, I think that organizations for prison reform are important, but for the right reasons um, in my eyes. And I do uh, echo what Dominique says with the, um, you know, the people that are impacted by this because um, the lived experiences I feel is so imperative for the change of work. Um, and um, I, I, I encourage people to, to create nonprofits and support groups. Um, uh, I do support that um, even if you aren't impacted in a way because we need more people to bring awareness to the system. Um, and we, we do need more change. So um, yeah, that's how I feel. We'll answer one more question. Thank you, ladies. And this comes from Johnny. And Johnny says, what kind of dream funding do you need? What kind of dream funding do you need? John, we need a building. We need a building. I need more staff. I have over 150 girls and right now I have three staff. Um, I, I envision this beautiful building that's maybe two stories with places that they can just come and be free and feel safe. Um, right now, there has a, there's a huge spike in violent crime among teenage, especially girls. And I feel like it's because we don't have nothing for them to do. There's nowhere for them to go. And I would just like to have a place where they can come after school, if they need to get some dinner, if they need to wash their clothes, um, if they need to take a shower before they head home, then we can find that we can provide that space for them. And um, I really, really want them to come to have a place where they can actually be who they are and not have to be um, this persona that um, you, you have to put on growing up in New Orleans. So I need some capacity building money. I need a brick and mortar money. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so uh, FOTI, uh, what we do is everybody that is on our leadership team, we, we really honestly do this from our heart. We don't get funding at all. We have not got a dime for six years. So we, we are not a nonprofit. Um, we literally do this from just because we feel that there needs to be change. Um, if we had our, if for me as the founder of FOTI, if I had my dream of funding is honestly, and I'm not, I'm not trying to get emotional, sorry, but is to really be able to get funding for the people that do the work because it's a lot of work. Um, and it can be really defeating sometimes, but um, I would love to be able to give back to my leadership team because they do a whole lot for a lot of people. And we get questions all day long um, of helping people just navigate through the system. So right now we do not get any funding. So. Dr. Harris, could I say something to Kalani? Sure, please. There's a conference happening in Atlanta, October 6th through 9th formerly incarcerated, convicted persons, family and friends movement. Um, they are a national nonprofit, formerly incarcerated men, women, children. If you can, I will make it to that conference. Rub shoulders, network, do what you have to do. And I guarantee you in a year or two, you'll have funding. May just be 10,000, maybe 20,000. We start off small but they're gonna get you the support that you need. Those people really take care of each other. Um, and it's like a little community of formerly incarcerated people. You have to see it, they are so amazing. 
And um, and what state are you in again? I'm in Washington. There's so many organizations that you're going to see in Washington at that event. I should I def and then there's this other event um, next weekend in Detroit, National Council for Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Who? Let me tell you, Dominique. Oh could you send that to me? That information to me, please. I will, Doc. I will. But there's so many. I, I receive the most love from formerly incarcerated people. I mean, and it's crazy because I grew up thinking that when people would tell me, hey, I know your dad, I would run because I didn't know in what capacity. And so I was always told my dad was this big, bad person. And these people, when they see me, they start crying mm -hmm. because they miss my dad so much. So you would definitely get the support there because I'm going. I'm first flight out. I'm going <laughs> to both events. Thank you. You're welcome. Definitely, definitely. Well, we are a little past the hour at 8.04, and I don't like to keep people, but are there any last minute, anything that you all want to say that I've not touched upon um, at all? And I think something else came in the chat. Just one minute. Okay, we've got an email from Catherine. So any last minute words? Um, that um, I've not touched upon. John, anything that you'd like to add that I've not touched upon before I um, conclude our panel? Well, I I just like to thank everybody. This was a very not only informative panel, but very moving panel. Like I'm very inspired by your passion for this. And so thank you very much for sharing that. And I echo too what, what uh, Dr. Foran has stated. And you know, I'm grateful to each one of you, Becky and Kailani and Dominique for just agreeing uh, to do this panel for this most important work that's near and dear to my heart. So. I thank you on behalf of certainly the, the center and uh, of the center and the members of the center. Um, I would like to also thank the attendees for, for coming and putting information in the chat and uh, comments are still coming in and I'm trying to read them as I'm getting ready to conclude. And uh, thank you certainly from Catherine and Dominique. Uh, Catherine sent you her email and I copied it. So I'm, do you have it? Because I can send it to you. You, do, you did get it. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Foran, for allowing us to do this and certainly uh, for sponsoring this and sponsoring our panelists. And having said that, I will bid everybody a good night and uh, a good life. Thank you all so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo.